Before we begin our discussion on oblique central impacts, I want to discuss a couple of terms. Before, we talked about a perfectly plastic term, and that's when two objects get stuck together and the coefficient of restitution was equal to zero. We also discussed when the coefficient of restitution is equal to one, and one of the things we talked about is that kinetic energy before and after the collision is the same, and that is referred to as a perfectly elastic collision. So if the coefficient of restitution is 1, we consider that to be a perfectly elastic collision. Many of our collisions will consider to be perfectly elastic. The other thing I wanted to make sure that we understand is that momentum is conserved when the net force, and maybe I should even say the net external force is equal to 0. So there could be a gravitational force, say, acting on a cart, that gravitational force is down, and that's an external force, and then there's a normal force up. And if those two forces cancel out to zero, this cart can have a collision with another cart, and momentum would still be conserved. The same thing might hold true if an object is hanging like this, and it strikes another hanging object. There's a gravitational force, mg, there's an upward force, tension. But the net force acting on these objects there might be another one here and here, the net force acting on these objects is still zero. Even though there are external forces, the net force is the critical issue. That has to be zero, and then the integral of F dt, where F is the net force, that will be equal to zero. And so the momentum previous to the collision and the momentum after the collision will be conserved. So let's take a look at oblique central impacts. In this case, we have two hockey pucks coming together, and they collide. Now, you'll notice that hockey puck B is moving along this line. Hockey puck A is moving along this line. And for the sake of simplicity, we're letting the velocity of hockey puck B be along the line of impact. Right Here's the point of impact, like we talked about in the last lecture. And then there is a mutual tangent. And at 90 degrees to that will be the line of impact. And we're going to allow that velocity of B is along that line of impact. It certainly doesn't have to be. The line of impact will be clear if you understand the shape of pucks A and B. Now, in this scenario, even though we still have an X and a Y, we also need to define a normal, which is along the line of impact, so the line of impact determines my normal direction. And then perpendicular to the line of impact is my tangential axis. All right, so the idea then is I have two objects coming together. I know the velocity of B, and that's a vector quantity. I know the velocity of A, and that's a vector quantity. What I don't know are the velocities of A and B after the collision. Now, as you look at these two unknowns, you really need to understand there are four unknowns here because this is a vector quantity. I don't know the speed of A. I don't know the speed of B. I don't know the angle of A or the direction of A. I don't know the direction of B. Or if you prefer, I don't know the velocity of A and the X after the collision, or the velocity of A and the Y, or normal tangential, however you want to look at it. I don't know the velocity of B and the X or the Y, or normal or tangential. So I need four equations in order to solve this out. How am I going to do that? First off, I'm going to assume that the surfaces are smooth and frictionless. So there's no rubbing between these hockey pucks. So that's going to mean that there are no forces acting on either puck in the tangential direction. So this could be puck A or B. So let's assume that's puck A. That means there's no force in this direction or this direction. These would be tangential forces. You're not going to have both of them. You're going to have one or the other. Those are the tangential forces. And the whole idea then is that there's no tangential force. Therefore, since there's no tangential force, the integral of f in the tangential direction, dt, is equal to 0 because there are no tangential forces. Now, that's not only true of the system. That is also true of each individual puck. So there's no force acting on puck A, even due to puck B. There's no force acting on puck B, even due to puck A, 
in the tangential direction. Since that's the case, then the mass times the velocity of A plus the integral of any tangential force acting on A dt equals the mass times the velocity of A afterward. These are vector quantities. Uh, actually, they're not vector quantities, but I'm only looking at the tangential direction. This is zero, and therefore mva equals mua in the tangential direction. Same thing is true for b. And that's what you're seeing in these two equations right here. So there's two of my equations. The tangential component of the velocity of a before the collision is equal to the tangential component of the velocity of a after the collision. That is to say, there is no change in the tangential component of the velocity of either particle, A or B, individually. So neither of those will change at all. So there's two equations, one, two. In addition, in the normal direction, I'm going to conserve momentum. So that's what I have here. There is a force between the pucks. So here's puck A, here's puck B. So puck A will exert a force on B. So this is the force on B due to A. And here's the force on A due to B. Newton's third law says those are equal and opposite. So as I look now at the system, so the sum of the momentums in the normal direction plus the integral of the normal forces, dt, will equal the sum of the momentums in the normal direction after. But this is going to be zero because the only forces in the normal direction are internal and so they cancel out. And so m1v1 plus m2v2 in the normal direction, that's what you're seeing right here, m sub a v sub a, m sub b v sub b in the normal direction, that will equal the normal components afterward. Now, very much like what we had with conservation of momentum earlier, the individual momentum of A and the individual momentum of B in the normal direction can change. But the total momentum of A and the total momentum of B in the normal direction will remain unchanged. That's equation number three. Finally, the whole definition of the coefficient of restitution still holds. And the restitution coefficient only applies in the normal direction. If you recall back when we were talking about direct central impacts, there was only a normal direction. But now in the oblique central impact case, the normal direction is where the coefficient of restitution will be valid. And so the velocity of B in the normal after the collision minus the velocity of A in the normal after the collision equals the coefficient of restitution times the velocity of A in the normal before the collision minus the velocity of B in the normal before the collision. Notice left side is B minus A, right side is A minus B. That could just as easily be A minus B on the left side as long as it's B minus A then on the right side. Let's look now at a special situation where I have what we refer to as constrained motion. And you've seen constrained motion before with ropes. In this case, it's still very similar. So I have a sphere, B, and it strikes a block, which is on rollers, A. Now the critical issue here is that block A cannot move up and down. There's no up and down movement allowed because block A is rolling on this surface. B can move up or down, but A cannot. So A is constrained. So we're going to say that object A is constrained to move in the x direction. So what that allows me to do is create conservation of momentum in the x direction. So the mass of A times the velocity of A, which can only be x, plus the mass of B times the velocity of B in the x direction. So this is the x component. And in my example, x is in this direction. y is in that direction. So the x component of B's velocity plus the x component of A's velocity before the collision, of course A can only move in the x direction, that's going to equal the x component of A's velocity after the collision, 
plus the x component of b's velocity after the collision. So there's one equation. Now in this constrained situation, I need three equations because there is no movement for a in the y direction. So I don't need to worry about four equations now. So here's equation number one. What are my other two equations? Well, if I take a close look at this diagram, here's my normal direction again and my tangential direction. There are no forces acting on B in the tangential direction. None. A is smooth and frictionless, and so it cannot exert any forces on B in the tangential direction. We're assuming in this problem that the force due to gravity acts only for a very short time period. That is to say, the collision has an extremely short duration. And so mg delta t, which is the impulse due to gravity, is approximately equal to zero. That is to say, we are ignoring any contribution to impulse that gravity might give because the time is so infinitely small. So there are no forces acting on B in the tangential direction, this direction or this direction. Therefore, the velocity of B in the tangential direction must remain completely unchanged. There's my second equation. The velocity of B in the tangential direction remains unchanged. The third equation goes back to restitution again. We can say that the velocity of A in the normal direction minus the velocity of B in the normal direction times the coefficient of restitution will equal the velocity of B in the normal direction minus the velocity of A in the normal direction. Now A is confined to move in this direction, the x direction, but it will have a component, it will have a component in the normal direction and the tangential direction. So there's the velocity, this is after the collision, let's say. This is the velocity of A in the normal direction, and this is the velocity of A in the tangential direction. Just revisiting equation one here just for a moment, the reason that momentum is conserved in the x direction is there are no external forces in the x direction. Nothing is touching any part of my system outside of the system, outside of block A and sphere B. Nothing is touching my system in the x direction. The surface here can exert a y force, but not an x force. We'll assume it's frictionless. And so the x momentum is conserved. All right, let's take a look at an example. So you can pause and read through this, but the idea here is I have a 17 and a half pound sphere. That's A, that's the big sphere. And it has a radius of four and a half inches. It's moving with the velocity, so it's coming in with a velocity of six feet per second. Now this velocity is just previous to its collision with sphere B. Sphere B has a weight of 1.6 pounds. There's the two weights, 1.6 pounds, and it has a 2-inch radius. Sphere B is initially at rest, so the velocity of B is equal to zero before the collision. Notice both spheres are hanging from identical, light, flexible cords. This problem is a little bit different if instead of flexible cords holding these on, if I have a solid rod of some type, then B is not allowed to move up. But in this particular situation, because I'm using light, flexible cords, and you can see that B is allowed to move up. A, however, is not allowed to move down. And so the movement of A is constrained. It cannot move down. And clearly when it strikes B, it's going to want to go down. But that's not going to be allowed. Coefficient of restitution is given at 0 0.8. We want to know the velocity of each sphere immediately after the impact. Velocity is a vector quantity. So first things first. Here's my x-axis. Here's my y-axis. Now you'll notice there are no forces external to the system acting in the x-direction. I've got tensions. I can even say I've got gravity. Those are all y. 
but there are no forces external to the system acting in the x-direction. So I can conserve momentum in the x-direction. But I also want to establish the line of impact, and that's my normal direction, and then perpendicular to the line of impact is my tangential direction. And given the four and a half inches and the two inches, I am able to determine a little bit about the angles. So if this is the center of A and this is the center of B, I know this distance is the radius of A, which is four and a half inches, plus the radius of B, which is two inches. So this is 6.5 inches. And I know that from here to here is four and a half inches. From here to here is two inches. And that leaves a distance here, which is the same as this distance here, of 2.5 inches. And that means this is six inches because this is going to be a 5, 12, 13 triangle. If you look at those ratios or those distances, you'll see that to be the case. All right, so since I have a 5, 12, 13 triangle, let's break the velocity of sphere A down into its components. So V0, which is the velocity of A previous to the collision, equals 6 feet per second in the I direction, plus 0 in the Y direction, the J hat direction. However, I'm actually more interested in its tangential and its normal components. So here's the vector in the x direction. There's a component in this direction and a component in that direction. This is 6. That's the hypotenuse. This is the angle theta, same as this angle theta. And so the opposite side will be 6 feet per second times the sine of theta since it's a 5, 12, 13 triangle, that would be 5 over 13. So this is 30 over 13 feet per second. In a similar fashion, this would be 6 feet per second times the cosine of theta, which is 12 over 13. And so this velocity is 72 over 13 feet per second. And so I can write the velocity as 30 over 13 E tangential plus 72 over 13 E normal. And to keep my sign straight, I'm actually going to make the tangential direction this way. Now, if I consider B, the velocity of B is equal to zero. That also means that the velocity of B in the tangential direction is equal to zero. It's not moving. But that has to equal the velocity of B in the tangential direction after the collision, which means B is constrained to move or has to move directly along the line of impact after the collision. Don't know what the speed is, but I do know the velocity of B will equal some speed, use a U for the velocity of B after the collision, will equal some speed U sub B strictly in the normal direction. Now I can break it down also into an X and a Y component. This is my still my 5, 12, 13 triangle. So this will equal 12 over 13 u sub b in the i hat direction plus 5 over 13 u sub b in the j hat direction. And finally, because of my constraint, a can only move in the x direction. It cannot move in the y direction. But even so, a will have a vector velocity Yes, it's equal to some magnitude in the i-hat direction, but this would be, and again, same 5, 12, 13 triangle, this will be 12 out of 13 u sub a in the normal direction, plus 5 out of 13 u sub b in the tangential direction. So my equations would be v sub b tangential, equals u sub b tangential equals zero. There's one equation. In the normal direction, I can write u sub b normal minus u sub a normal equals e times v sub a 
normal minus v sub b normal. But v sub b in the normal is zero, because remember, b wasn't moving at all. v sub a in the normal, I know, this was 72 over 13 feet per second. u sub b in the normal is just u sub b. And u sub a in the normal is 12 over 13 u sub a, whatever that magnitude is. And e was given as 0 0.8. So the only unknowns in this equation are u sub b and u sub a. So I have two unknowns, u sub b and u sub a. My final equation is momentum in the x. So I have the mass of a, which I know, times the velocity of a, which is 6 feet per second, strictly in the x direction. That will equal the mass of a, which I know, times the velocity of a, which has to be in the x direction. So that's u sub a, plus the mass of b times the velocity of b in the x direction, which was 12 over 13 u sub b. So this equation, I don't know u a and u b. And this equation, I don't know u a and u b. Two equations and two unknowns.